Well, good afternoon. It is an incredible honor for me to be here this afternoon. It's an incredible challenge, too, to be talking to you just after lunch. But I'm up for the challenge to keep you guys awake. This is going to be fast-paced. Uh, James 1.19 says, be slow to speak, but it doesn't say speak slow. So I'm going to go really fast. We're going to be covering a lot of stuff. Some of you might be wondering, okay, well, who is this guy and what's he talking about creation evolution uh, for with this particular conference? Well, what happened was Chuck was looking at the schedule of all these incredible speakers with just incredible topics, and he thought, this is such good stuff. I wonder if people are going to get bored with great talk after great talk. He said, we, we need to find a clinker to put someone in here who's not a good speaker and give him a topic no one cares about. And so he called me because he was the first person I thought of. And so now maybe it didn't actually happen that way, but you're going to see the tie in here. Lewis already referred to this here, is that every topic that you've already heard and will hear has this in common, that the Bible is the ultimate authority for us as Christians in everything we believe. Now, the Bible arguably gets attacked more for its creation account than any other area. And if we can't trust what God tells us about the beginning, how can we trust him for anything else? And so we're going to be looking at this. That's why we're looking at the creation evolution controversy. Very, very foundational topic to everything else that we're talking about at this particular conference. And we have a problem. This has been alluded to, too. Right now, 50 to 75% or more, maybe 80% or higher of Christian students end up walking away from their faith before they finish college. Now, how in the world can something like that happen? There are a number of factors that are going on, but one of the biggest things is that we have a set of beliefs without convictions. <laughs> kind of know what we believe, but we're not really sure why. We can't really defend our faith, and this is happening left and right. These are not children or students from religious homes. These are kids from evangelical, fundamental Christian homes who are walking away from their faith. I hear this all the time as I travel around the country and speak. Uh, just one example, I was speaking at a mega church in Florida, and afterwards I had shared this in the service, these statistics, and I had a woman come up to the table literally crying. She said, that was my son. He grew up in our home believing in God and Jesus Christ and the Bible and all that. He went off to college, and after one semester, came back and said, I'm an atheist. Starts debating his mom. She can't answer any of the questions. And he said, that's what I thought. My professor told me you wouldn't know. You just believe all this silly Bible stuff. He goes, well, I'm in college. I'm learning truth. I'm learning about science. And he walks off. Just heartbroken. And she said, would you please talk with him? And I said, well, you, you live in the Tampa area. I live in the Milwaukee area. She said, I would pay to fly you down and put you up in a condo if you would just spend some time talking with him. I wish I had time for the whole story, and I don't. We're just touching the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg here this afternoon. But just giving you a little bit of that story, I did end up going down, spent three and a half hours with this guy in a restaurant, him swearing at me the whole time, angry young man. He was about 23 years old. Um, afterwards, again, skipping a lot of detail. Afterwards, I told him, I said, you know what, I don't want to offend you in any way, but I'm going to pray for you every day. He actually said thank you, which is odd from an atheist. That was a year ago this week. I had prayed for him every day. I think I actually missed three days in the past year, but I've been praying for him every day. Just two weeks ago, I got an email. We've been keeping in contact. He sent me an email. He said he wants to be baptized. It's, just, it's awesome. And if I had time to tell you, it was really nothing to do with science or academics. That's not what it's about. This is a spiritual battle that we're dealing with here. But this is one of the reasons why we want to have reasons for what we believe. So we're going to be getting into that. My background in a nutshell, I was raised in a Christian home. You can see very clearly that is a Christian home. <laughs> uh, then I went to public school all the way through high school. After I graduated from high school, I went to a Christian college, John Brown University, to study mechanical engineering partway through. I became more interested in physics, and so I left John Brown, went back to Wisconsin, went to the University of Wisconsin at Whitewater to get a degree in physics. And that's when my world changed quite a bit because all my professors were telling me that I was wrong about everything I believed. And that really disturbed me because I realized for the first time in my entire life that even though I knew what I believed, I didn't know why. <laughs> How did I know that God existed? 
How did I know the creation account was scientifically valid? That was a big one, studying physics. How did I know there was a worldwide flood? How do I know Jesus was the Son of God? How do I know he rose from the dead? How do I know the Bible is the inspired word of God? I believed all of those things, but I had no real reasons or defense for it. And I assume my physics professors had a defense for their beliefs. I found out later they really didn't, but I was very intimidated by them. So God put it on my heart at that point in my life to start researching all these things. That was actually 28 years ago. So I have been researching and speaking for 28 years now. Uh, about seven and a half years ago, I moved into full-time ministry, uh, starting the Creation Education Center. Shortly before that, I had an offer from Ken Ham and Answers in Genesis to be a speaker. Just felt God telling me to, to, to turn it down. And then uh, I also did some part-time speaking for Creation Ministries International. But I've been speaking for quite a while now. And the point isn't just to talk about science. It's really ultimately about the authority of God's Word. Now, one of the most important things that I learned when I was studying physics was this. To never trust an atom because they make up everything. <laughs> now... Now, the reason I put that up there is to get you guys to beg me to stick with science and leave the, the humor up to the professionals. I have a very dry sense of humor. Um, so you're just going to have to put up with that for a little bit here. Um, I did mention I am from Wisconsin. It's a real state. We love our cheese and our Packers. <laughs> My wife is here, too. She's been helping out the table, so please introduce yourself to her afterwards. Uh, she's been able to help me out. She's been wonderful for the ministry and really helped me refine how I present things. Um, we know also in Wisconsin it gets cold. Last winter was, was really nasty. That one day we actually got two feet of snow in one day. <laughs> Just, I warn you, <laughs> you can leave now, otherwise you have yourself to blame. So it doesn't get any better than that. So <laughs> downhill from here. But with this particular talk, I've actually coined a new term. We talk about apologetics, you know, which is a defense of the Christian faith. And in science, we talk about genetics, you know, DNA and things like that. Well, I'm combining them to call it apologenetics. Uh, kind of a clever term here. Using what we see in our physical bodies to defend the truths of Christianity and Scripture. Very, very exciting. Now, jumping into this particular talk here. How many of you have ever seen Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Quite a few of you have. Kind of a dangerous show to watch because you might find out that maybe you're not smarter than a fifth grader. <laughs> But we're going to switch this up this afternoon and ask, are you smarter than a PhD scientist? Now, most people would say, well, of course not. I mean, those guys are brilliant. I honestly believe that after you hear the information in this talk, you truly will be smarter than the vast majority of PhD scientists on this planet when it comes to the creation evolution controversy because the majority of scientists out there are not studying evolution or the origin of the universe. They're brilliant men and women, but they're making food preservatives, uh, rocket fuel, cell phones, good stuff, but they're not even studying this. Even the scientists who do study some of this, they specialize in certain areas and a lot of them aren't even aware of this. So this is cutting edge stuff, in fact, I went to a bioinformatics symposium at Cornell University two summers ago. It was 27 lectures in three days. It was intense. And I took a lot of that information and put it into this particular talk and went back out to New York and spent time with Dr. John Sanford, Cornell University professor, and had him look at the, the presentation. He said, yep, it's accurate. And so this is exciting stuff that you're going to see here. Going to go through some background stuff and then get into the cutting edge stuff towards the latter third of the talk here. Quick review, we don't have time to cover all three of these points here. I wish I had time, but we're going to at least cover the definition of evolution because the word evolution is used in so many different ways. When I'm talking about evolution, I am not simply talking about change. We see change all the time. So when Christians say, oh, I don't believe in evolution, the skeptics and atheists say, what are you, crazy? We, we see change all the time because they're equating evolution with change. They're the same thing. They're not the same thing. Evolution would require change, but it's a very specific type of change. So I'm not just talking about change. We see change all the time. No one denies that. I'm also not talking about different types of dogs and cats and horses, which we see that all the time, or different beaks that we see on finches that Darwin got very excited about. These are facts of science. Nobody denies them, but they have nothing to do with evolution as they're teaching it in the school systems and state universities. 
This is what I'm referring to by evolution, that supposedly about 3.8 billion years ago, non-living chemicals came together to form a living cell which then changed into every other life form on this planet over millions and millions and millions and millions of years by accident. This, I personally believe, is a story that's told about the past. And I don't believe there's any real science behind it. We also refer to this as what we call molecules to man evolution. I would highly advise you, if you're talking to someone about evolution, don't just say evolution, say that you don't believe in molecules to man evolution. Molecules form a living cell which turns into human beings. I, again, I don't think there's any evidence for that, but we needed to define what we're talking about here this afternoon. Now, here's the general premise of this talk. Certain things, when you look at them from a certain angle or distance, they look great. Like this shiny BMW. Looks wonderful. You envision opening the hood and seeing a beautiful engine underneath there. What if when you opened that hood, instead of seeing this beautiful engine, you saw this? The engine's missing. Just a bunch of wires hanging there. No, it doesn't look so good anymore. So what at first looked so great upon closer inspection doesn't look so good anymore. Maybe that's why it had a $500 price tag on it or something. We see the same type of thing with evolution. Certain portions of the evolutionary story seem so plausible, but upon closer inspection you see just not going to work. For example, you have an Australian lungfish and a newt. These two creatures do not look completely different. It does not take much imagination to envision the fins on the lungfish getting a little longer and stronger and kind of crawling better and creeping out of the water, learning how to breathe air better and all these things, just little changes over time. It doesn't take much imagination for that. But when you peek under the hood and see what would have to go on in the DNA to make these changes, that's when you realize it's just not going to happen. Here's an interesting quote from Dr. Richard Dawkins, one of the world's leading atheists, very outspoken evolutionist, fairly intelligent scientist. Many of you are probably familiar with him. This is what he said. You cannot be both sane and well-educated and disbelieve in evolution. The evidence is so strong that any sane, educated person has got to believe in evolution. Very dogmatic statement from a fairly intelligent scientist. This happens all the time. It's very intimidating. And a lot of our own kids become very quiet in the classes. They don't want to say they don't believe in evolution because otherwise they're saying they're, they're crazy, they're insane. But what's interesting is that Proverbs 18, 17 says this. The first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. We've all been in those situations where you hear something and at first you're like, wow, that sounds pretty good. You can't argue with that. But then someone else says, well, wait a minute. Did you know about this? What about that? What about that? And you're like... Oh, yeah, I didn't know that. Okay, that, that doesn't sound so good anymore. And that happens pretty often. I facetiously say that evolution 1-1 says the only one to plead his cause seems right because no one else is allowed to challenge him or present other views. This is what we have in the public school system and state university. They're only teaching one view. So, of course, it's going to seem very plausible to the students. They're not going to hear an alternative to it. Now, I wish I had time for the big picture to give more backdrop to this. We do have a DVD called Creation versus Evolution, the Case from Science, where we cover some more of these details. But the big picture would include this. You've got to explain, how do you get something out of nothing? Whether you're an atheist, a Buddhist, a Muslim, a Christian, whoever you are, whatever your worldview is, you have to explain, how do we get something to begin with? Secondly, once we had matter and energy, how did it form stars, galaxies, and planets? That's a big problem with the laws of physics. Once you have stars, galaxies, and planets, how do you get chemicals on one of those planets to form a living cell? That's one of the biggest problems for evolution. But evolution say, no, that's not our problem. We just talk about how one creature changes to do another. Yeah, but you have to get the creature to begin with. You have to get that living cell. Well, that's someone else's problem. No, it's part of your worldview problem. You need to have an answer for that. That's one of their biggest challenges. Lastly, once you have life started in some single-celled organism, how do you get that to turn into every other life form on this planet by accident? And that's what we're going to focus on a little bit more with this particular talk, the origin of species, the variety of life. Specifically, how do you get a single-celled organism to turn all the way into a human being? Now, there's a lot of arranging and storytelling that goes on with evolution. As a simple analogy, we have four modes of transportation up here. And we could arrange these things from simpler to more complex and discuss the evolution of the motorcycle how the small wheels in the back of the tricycle came together to form a larger wheel and some chains of the bicycle. Then the chains of the bicycle moved into an electric motor of the scooter. 
And eventually the electric motor of the scooter moved forward and turned into a gas combustion engine. And that's how we got motorcycles. Now, we know that's a crazy story, but all I did is arrange these things in logical order and then told a nice story. And that's what we see with evolution quite a bit. For example, we have the evolution of the horse from Eohippus all the way to the modern horse. Here's an interesting quote from Dr. Niles Eldridge. He's a former curate at the American Museum of Natural History, very ardent evolutionist. This is what he said. I admit that an awful lot has gotten into the textbooks as though it were true. For instance, the most famous example still on exhibit in the American Museum is the exhibit on horse evolution. By the way, again, that's his museum. That has been presented as literal truth in textbook after textbook. Now I think that that is lamentable, but by the time it filters down to the textbooks, we've got a problem. <laughs> What's he saying? Uh, apparently it's okay in the museums where everyone's filtering through and seeing all these proofs of evolution, but when you put it in the textbooks and you know it never happened, yeah, maybe that's a problem. I think it's a problem in the museum too if it never actually happened. And then we have this example too, how fish evolved into amphibians over maybe 20 million years. Well, what did it look like in between, in the millions of years as it's transitioning? That's what we call a missing link, a big problem. But you know what? It's not missing anymore. They found it. Tiktaalik. They found the missing link. Proof of, you know, transition here. Actually, I don't have time to go into it. It's already been disqualified. It doesn't count. They just found another file. So it looked like it fit in between the other ones. So you put it in between the others and you tell the story. But doing this isn't much different than doing this. Talking about how an Etch-a-Sketch evolved into an iPad. Because <laughs> those two things don't look completely different. Yeah, there are some similarities there. Would it look like in between? Um, maybe something like that. <laughs> Use your imagination. But we all know there's no way that the simple internal workings of an Etch-a-Sketch could, on their own by accident, turn into the, something as complex as an iPad. It's not going to happen. But those are the types of stories that we hear. So how do we get that single-celled organism to turn into a human being in almost four billion years, supposedly? Well. When we have children, <laughs> our kids don't come out looking exactly like us. Changes happen. They may have similar hair color, eye colors, and things like that, but they don't look exactly like us. We know that changes happen. Well, there are two major types of changes that we see. We've got built-in variation, and we've got random mutations. Now, the built-in variation has to do with the genes and segments on our DNA. We've learned a lot about that. We kind of know what might happen depending upon which gene gets expressed and things like that. We kind of know what to expect there. The random mutations are accidental copying errors. Because they're accidental, we don't know what to expect there. So we're going to look at these two things. We're going to start looking at the built-in variation here. We have two dogs up on the screen. These are medium-length fur dogs and they each have genes that code for fur length. They actually have two copies of each gene. We all have two copies of each gene. These dogs have one copy of a gene that makes long fur, one gene that makes short fur, and they happen to combine to make medium length fur. Now, when they breed and reproduce, they each get to pass along one gene. They don't get to choose which one goes. One will go or the other. So when they breed, if they both pass on a gene for short fur, the puppy comes out with two genes, two copies, but they both make short fur. Doesn't matter which gene is expressed or even if they combine, it's going to have short fur. If they both pass on a gene to make long fur, then the puppy has to come out with long fur. Thirdly, if one passes on a gene for long fur, the other one passes on a gene for short fur, they will typically come out with medium length fur, but it could be long or short depending upon which gene is expressed. So these genes can make a variety of you know, features that we see in the dogs. It doesn't just make fur length, it does other things too. It makes big dogs, small dogs, long ears, short ears, all the features that we see in dogs are all pre-coded there in the DNA. Okay, now if you look at these two sets of animals, you can ask yourself, which set do the animals look more like each other? They're more similar. Pretty obvious, the animals in set A look a lot more like each other than the animals in set B. Why is that? Because the animals in set A are really all the same kind of animal. Genesis chapter 1 says 10 times that God would create creatures to reproduce after their kind. And today, dogs, dingoes, coyotes, and wolves can all breed together because they're the same kind of animal. For example, you can breed a dog and a wolf, and guess what you get? You get a wolf dog. It's real science. It actually happens. 
but you can breed a wolf and a dog until you're blue in the face and you're never going to get an ostrich. <laughs> because they don't have genes to make fur or feathers and beaks. Just, it can't happen. Now there's some other animals you can breed together. You can breed a zebra and a donkey to get a zonkey. It sounds pretty funny, but this is actually real science. Why, are those completely different animals? No, it's pretty much the same animal. One just has a nice paint job. <laughs> you could also breed a lion and a tiger and you get a liger. <laughs> Sounds funny, but why? Because they're both large cats. But what you can't do is breed a lion and a kangaroo to give you a liangaroo. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Why? Because they're not the same kind of animal. We don't expect that. Now, there are some other animals you're also not going to get. And that would be these. <laughs> This is what happens when you have Photoshop and too much time on your hands. <laughs> of which I have neither. I didn't do these. I got them off the internet. But they're fun because you can tell it's just not going to happen. They're not the same kinds of animals. Well, that was a built-in variation. So let's take a look at these random mutations now. What's going on there? We are now transformed into a state university classroom or maybe a public high school science classroom. And I am an evolutionary professor and I'm going to teach you how evolution works. So picture yourself sitting in that class and I'm going to show you how evolution works. We have an organism up there. It's going to reproduce itself. It has DNA, so it has to copy its DNA to make the children. So it copies its DNA and the children come out and the children look pretty much like the parents because it's the same DNA. Then the children have children, which are the grandchildren, and they come out looking pretty much like the parents and the grandparents because it's the same DNA. Then the grandchildren reproduce and they have great-grandchildren and, oops, <laughs> something's going on here. We got some significant mutations, scopping errors happening here. And you can see that some of these copies and mutations are bad. Some of them are good. Then natural selection comes along like a superhero, wipes out the bad changes and keeps the good ones. And then reproduction continues. The new good ones make more of themselves and then the original ones make more of themselves. And imagine this continuing on for millions and millions of years. Can you imagine the great variety of life we would have on this planet? I guarantee you, the non-Christian students sitting in this classroom say, you know what, that makes perfect sense to me. It's proof of evolution. You can't argue with that. But I guarantee you, the Christian students sitting in this classroom says, that makes perfect sense to me. Can't argue with that. I guess the Bible isn't quite right. You know, the, the Bible was written a long time ago, you know, people dragging their wives out of caves and, you know, you know, Bedouins in the deserts and they weren't too smart, so God made up this story about six-day creation and can't really take that seriously. And we know the flood didn't happen because where did all that water come from? Where did all that water go? How did you get all those animals in the dark? And that didn't really happen, so we'll kind of write that off. And so the Bible's not meant to be taken that way seriously anyway. It's just this thing about faith and it can be really interpreted any way you want. So there's a slippery slope and many of them end up just walking away completely. Why hold on to the Jesus stuff? If it's wrong about history, how do we know it's right about the spiritual issues? And so many of them walk away because this makes a lot of sense to them. What we're going to do now, though, is something that Paul Harvey used to do. And most of you remember Paul Harvey. I loved Paul Harvey. He would tell you the rest of the story. That's what we're going to look at now, the rest of the story with mutations. Can these mutations do what I just described? Very interesting. I'm going to make three major points about mutations here. First of all, that they're purposeless, undirected, and random. Secondly, that they occur in the DNA. And thirdly, that they're almost entirely detrimental or bad. I'm going to talk about each one of these in turn very quickly here. First point, that they're undirected. They're random. Very interesting. Here's an interesting quote from Nova Online, a very strong evolutionary source. And this is what they tell us about these mutations. So it's sometimes convenient when trying to make sense of evolution to think of changes within a species of having a purpose, as though Mother Nature has some intended goal she sets out to achieve. The bacteria want to survive. Someone might reason when thinking about the declining effects of antibiotics, and so they evolve into resistant strains. Of course, there is no purpose in evolution, just random mutations within DNA, most of which are detrimental to the survivability of the organism. Those are the three points that I just made, all in this one quote, by an evolutionist. Here's another interesting quote from Discovery News. 
talking about dinosaurs. It said presumably the sauropods or dinosaurs evolved large body size as a strategy to deter predators. Okay, what are they saying here? Humorously, you could look at it this way. They're telling you that apparently at some point in the past, dinosaurs weren't as large as they eventually came to be. So they're sitting around the campfire one night, and they're saying, hey, guys, we, we got to come up with a strategy uh, because if we don't do something soon, the predators are going to eat us, and we're going to go extinct much quicker than we expected. Do you guys have any ideas? And they're like, no, our brains are too small. <laughs> but then one of the dinosaurs says, I have an idea. What if when they come after us, we get our machine guns and we shoot them? And the first dinosaur says, we can't do that. They haven't been invented yet. So, okay, good point. Second dinosaur says, I know. What if the, when they come after us, we all jump on our motorcycles and ride off into the sunset? First dinosaur again says, we, we can't do that either because they haven't been invented yet. So, okay. Third dinosaur says, I have an idea. What if we all evolve really large body sizes and scare them away? Then the first dinosaur says, now that's a good idea. Are we all in agreement? Okay, break. And they go and they get big. That's what's being implied here. This was a strategy of how to deter predators. I don't know an evolutionist on this planet who believes that. They will all tell you, no, there's no purpose. They're not trying to do anything. They're just reproducing themselves, copying their DNA, and the mistakes happen. But yet, this is what you will see in the popular literature all the time. Strategies. The fish in the ocean needed to evolve the ability to uh, breathe air because they were running out of food in the oceans and there was food on land, and so they, they needed that ability, so they evolved it. We see this in textbooks, television programs, magazines, as if they're trying to do something. But in reality, even the leading evolutionists say, no, it doesn't work that way. That was the first point. I'm flying through this really quick. These mutations occur within the DNA. So let's take a look at DNA very quickly here. You know, DNA is like a very, very, very complex blueprint with lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of information on it. So much information. I'm going to give you an analogy here. Let's say you had just a teaspoon amount of DNA and you wanted to back up the amount of information that would fit in that volume onto CDs. And we back up our hard drives in case they crash. So you're going to back up just a teaspoon amount of DNA on CDs. Now, a single CD can hold about 100,000 pages of text. That's a lot of information on one CD. So how many CDs would you need to back up just a teaspoon amount of your own DNA? You would need 100 CDs. Don't write that down because I just lied. <laughs> Probably shouldn't, but you would actually need 1,000 CDs. Don't write that down yet. <laughs> you would need 1 million CDs. That's the last time I'm going to lie. That's only a partial truth. You would actually need one million CDs given to you every minute for nine and a half years. Then you'd have enough CDs to back up a teaspoon amount of your DNA. That's five trillion CDs. That gives you an appreciation for our national debt. <laughs> but imagine, someone walks up to you and said, hey, I heard you're going to back up that teaspoon of DNA here. Here's a million CDs. And they hand it to you and you're holding it. Not that you could actually hold it, but so you're holding it now. He says, I'll be back. They come back a minute later. Give, Here's another million. Now you're holding two stacks. I'll be back. They do that every minute for nine and a half years. Can you imagine how annoying that would be? <laughs> but then you'd finally have enough storage space to back up that much DNA. But you know what? They'll take our tax dollars and they'll tell our kids that this all happened by accident. There is no God. Our kids walk away from their faith, and we say, thank you very much. We're paying them to help them walk away from their faith. I don't think it's the public school teacher's fault. I don't think it's the state university's fault. They can aid in this process. I don't think it's pastor's fault. I think it's largely our fault as Christians. We are to be mentoring our children and giving them answers so that when they hear things like that in school, they say, I knew you were going to say that, but here's the response. But we drop the ball because we can't give our kids something that we don't have. When we don't have answers, well, that's why I don't need all that. I just believe the Bible. Maybe that works for you, but then you can't witness anyone and you can't mentor your children. And it's, so it's no shock that they're walking away left and right because we don't tell them why we believe what we believe. And go off on a tangent there. Got to get back to the talk here. DNA, we know it's like a coiled up ladder there. It's like a set of encyclopedias. And the rungs on this ladder, each rung is like a letter from the set of encyclopedias. That's what we call a nucleotide, a single rung there. You put a bunch of these rungs together, and that's what words would be, the groupings of these nucleotides. Then the chapters are represented by thousands or tens of thousands of these rungs. 
And then you get a volume, a single volume out of that set of encyclopedias. That's what we call a chromosome, which is like thousands of genes or thousands of chapters. And finally, the entire set of encyclopedias, that's what we call the genome. For people, we call it the human genome. You've all heard that phrase. That's how DNA is structured, a little biology 101 there. Move on very quickly here. Get to the last portion here. This is the most interesting part, that these mutations, these accidental copying errors, are largely detrimental or bad. And here's how the story of evolution goes. The little analogy I'm going to give you here comes from Dr. John Sanford, Cornell University professor. He's the one that uh, invited me to the bioinformatics symposium originally, and then I went out and spent time with him to kind of vet this talk to make sure it was you know, perfectly accurate. Um, here's his analogy. He said, let's say the amount, oh, it comes from his book, Genetic Entropy, and a, a new version is just coming out. He's mailing me a copy, so it's just coming out. But a, a fantastic book, a lot of information in it. But he said, let's say that the amount of information in a single cell bacteria is about the amount of information in a biochemistry textbook. And we know there's a lot of information in that textbook. And that's about how much information is in a single cell bacteria. There's no simple cells. There's a lot of information, but remember, we have to turn that cell into a human being, which has even more information in it. So we can't just copy that cell. We've got to do something to it to change it into a human being. Well, here's a page from that biochemistry textbook, and there's a text there. Now, again, if we just kept copying this textbook perfectly, a million years from now, we just have lots more of these textbooks. It would be exactly the same. So we can't do that. We have to make changes. Well, what are these changes? We've been talking about them. They're the mutations, the accidental copying errors. Well, here's some examples of these mutations. First of all, we have a duplication mutation up towards the top there. I've added an extra T in the word the. Now, if you were reading that textbook, you'd say, well, I know it's just the word the. It's just a typo. That's not how our genes work. It would look at that and say, I've never seen that before. I don't know what it is. It would skip it. Then we have a deletion mutation. We delete the letter E in energy. It doesn't spell energy anymore. Again, you'd say, okay, there's some, something happened there. It's really the word energy. No, our genes wouldn't know that. And then, then you have a substitution. You take the N in electron and put a Y in there instead. What's interesting is you could ask a kindergartner. This is a really important point. You could ask a kindergartner, hey, what's your favorite book? And then they tell you what book they like. You say, if we were to take your book and just randomly open to whatever page, stick our finger in there, whatever letter we touch, we just delete that letter or change it to a different letter or reverse it or whatever. We just keep doing that to your book over time. What would happen to your book? Would it get better and better and better? A kindergartner will tell you no. It would get worse and worse. In fact, it wouldn't take long. I wouldn't be able to read it at all. A kindergartner will understand that. You have to be highly educated to not get this. And I really don't want to be sarcastic because I have a lot of respect for the scientists that are out there. This is not an academic debate. All the skeptics that I know, they're plenty brilliant. A lot of them are a lot more intelligent than I am. It's not that they're lacking facts. Their worldview is off, and that's what they're using to interpret the facts. So instead of attacking the facts, we need to be asking questions about their worldview because this stuff is so clear to us. Again, Romans chapter 1, starting about verse 19 on, will explain why they don't see it this way because they've already rejected God. God, there are no atheists. Everybody knows that God exists because God has made it plain to them, but some have chosen to reject that knowledge and they call themselves atheists and because of that, God has given them over to a reprobate thinking, professing themselves to be wise and become fools. That's not name calling. God is talking about their thinking process. So when you throw these raw facts at them and they say, I don't see it as evidence for God, don't get frustrated. It's not about the facts. It's about their worldview and it's a spiritual issue. But the challenge for evolution gets worse than what we've just talked about. This is where we get into some cutting edge stuff from DNA science. Really, really interesting. Let's say you're looking at a segment of your DNA and you're reading it. And it spells out, was it a rat I saw? Kind of a weird phrase. Let's clean it up, take the punctuation away. Was it a rat I saw? Well, in English, we read from left to right. But you may have already noticed you could read this backwards. Was it a rat I saw. <laughs> it's called a palindrome. You can read it forwards and backwards. It's kind of fun. It doesn't have a lot of meaning to it, but you can read it forwards and backwards. This is what we've discovered about much of our DNA. Much of it can be read not only forwards, but also backwards. But the challenge for evolution gets worse than that because that was the same message forwards and backwards. Take a look at this, the word desserts. You flip that around and it spells stress, which is what I get when I don't get desserts. <laughs> 
let's introduce a random mutation. We'll just randomly delete the T. You know what? That random mutation not only messed up the word desserts, it messed up the word stress. It doesn't spell either of those words. One random change messed up two messages because of the forwards and backwards effect. Now, when we're looking at our DNA, we don't see these little words that flip back and forth. We see up to entire chapters of complex information that can be read forwards and backwards. Let me give you a simple analogy to make your head spin if it isn't already spinning. Let's say you all work for a smartphone factory and it's your job and training to write the instruction manual to give to the manufacturing plant to make these phones. So your bo boss comes to you one day and says, I've got a project for you. I need you to write the chapter in this manual that will explain how these phones are going to download apps from the web. You say, sure, yeah, I can do that. That's your training. So he's walking away, and then all of a sudden he turns around and goes, oh, wait a minute, sorry, I forgot one thing, a little minor detail. When you write your chapter that's going to explain how the phone will download these apps, you have to write it in such a way that if we read it backwards, it's going to explain how the phone's going to play music files. And you're, you look at him, you're like, boy, you're kidding me, right? He says, no, I'm sorry, we only have so much room in the manual, we need to get those messages forwards and backwards. That is humanly impossible. You can't even program a computer to do that. It could do computer programming for 18 years. It can't be done. Yet this is what we're seeing in our DNA. You read it one way, there's an entire chapter that makes certain proteins, and proteins carry out all the functions in our bodies. You read it backwards, it makes completely different proteins that have a completely different function. Number one, how do particles smashing together create something like this to begin with, and how do you make random changes to it, make it better and better? You can't. But the challenge for evolution gets even worse than that. Take a look at this strange phrase here. I like chocolate later that evening. Why is it weird? It's weird because it's two phrases that overlap. We have I like chocolate, which is true. And then we have later that evening. And the overlap here in the middle, L-A-T-E, shares those letters here. This is what we're seeing in our DNA. We have overlapping instructions. Let's introduce a random mutation here. Let's change the E into an H. That one random change messed up both messages. It doesn't spell I like chocolate, and it doesn't spell later that evening. What's interesting is we actually see up to entire chapters of information that overlap each other in our DNA. But guess what? It gets even worse than that. Take a look at the same phrase here. Again, let's underline certain portions here and then bring them down below. And it spells I like her hat. It's called alternative splicing. This is what we see in our DNA. Let's introduce another random mutation here. We'll randomly delete the H. It doesn't spell I like chocolate, but it all now also doesn't spell I like her hat. We messed up the spliced message, as well as the overlapping and the forwards and reverse and all that. This is what we see in our DNA, but we don't see just little segments that are spliced. We see up to long sentences and short paragraphs. So take that biochemistry textbook and just start going to different chapters and taking some sentences out here, short paragraphs from different places, put them together, you got a whole other set of information there. Try to write that humanly. It can't be done. But the challenge for evolution gets worse than that. We have embedded information. Take a look at this. Can you show Mike Olson checks from Oliver's labeled facts and set it on Herb's desk? Let's just circle every ninth letter in this phrase here and bring those letters below. It spells chocolate. It's kind of a theme going on here. It's my talk. I can do that. <laughs> There's an embedded message there. Well, let's introduce another random mutation. We'll just delete the W up there. What that would do is that would shift every letter after that over one spot. So now the ninth letters would be these circled. You bring those down below and it spells that, which is completely meaningless. So one random change messed up the embedded information as, long as, as well as the splice and overlapping and forwards and backwards and all that. But guess what? It gets worse than that. We have encrypted messages. I actually had two interviews with the CIA to work in their cryptographic analysis division. Story for another time. Let's take a look at this phrase here. It would appear to be completely meaningless. Let's say you found out that there was actually an encryption key Meaning everywhere you see an H up there, it's really an A. Everywhere you see a B, it's really a C. For example, everywhere you see a Y, it's a T. So those two Ys up there are really Ts. So let's do all the substitutions here, and you see that this phrase spells this as an encrypted message. That's one way we do encrypted message systems. Well, guess what we're seeing in our DNA? Encrypted message systems. 
Let's take a time out here and just ask ourselves, what would it take to create an encrypted message system? Keeping in mind, there is no God. Everything's just an accident. So you literally have particles smashing together, and that's supposed to create an encrypted message system. Here are the steps you'd have to accomplish. First of all, you have to develop a language system using symbols. So we have three sticks here. When we arrange them this way, we're going to say that's an A. Then we have some symbols that look this way. When you put them together in this fashion, that's going to be a B. You have to create an entire alphabet by particle smashing together randomly. After that, you need to be able to create and define words. When you put these four letters together, it's going to represent this particular object. You have to create an entire dictionary of words and definitions by particle smashing together. Then you have to be able to write meaningful sentences and paragraphs which require rules of grammar. <laughs> How do particles smashing together create rules of grammar? Then after that, you have to be able to establish the actual encryption system with the key. After that, you have to be able to create the system to do the coding and the decoding. And finally, you have to be able to have the ability to read and carry out the instructions. Otherwise, the whole thing is useless. How do particles smashing together create this? I don't know a scientist on the planet who can even begin to explain how this is even remotely possible, but yet that's what we see in our DNA. And yep, it gets worse than that. We actually have 3D information in our DNA. This is a little bit harder to depict, but the DNA makes these different proteins, and the proteins have to get folded in a very specific three-dimensional configuration. If they don't get folded just right, They'll be useless, and they're usually disassembled, and the components are reused. So let's just have seven words going straight across the screen here, and then we're going to, in a sense, try to fold these words. We're going to stack them on top of each other in somewhat of a three-dimensional fashion. When we do them just the right way, you see another piece of information going up and down vertically there, the word success. Now, if you were to introduce a random letter change, deletion, reverse something, stack them the wrong way, you lose that 3D information. And this is what we see in our DNA. There's information in the 3D configuration. One last time. I'm actually skipping things. You can thank me for that later. Um, one last example. There's actually communication going on between the cell membrane and the DNA inside the nucleus. What happens when you make random changes to the coding in the DNA? How is the cell membrane going to know that? The DNA would have to say, hey, membrane, just so you know, we made these random changes. You need to keep that in mind as you communicate with us. How is that going to be coordinated? It's not, but yet this is what we see going on. There's a whole other area called epigenetics, which is information outside the DNA. It's just, it, it even almost blows this away. It's, it's something relatively new, and scientists are really grappling with that, but it just gets more and more complex. But even with all of that, I have proof that evolution is true. You are 98% similar in your DNA to chimpanzees. <laughs> How many of you have ever heard anything like that? 97, 95, 98, quite a few of you. It's all magazines, television programs, and all that, and the school system's proof that we're related to, to the chimpanzees. PBS said that this difference, the small difference between chimps and humans, it amounts to just a couple of spelling errors. What does that mean? That means you take the chimp genome, very, very complex, just introduce a couple of spelling errors, these random changes we've been talking about, and voila, you have a human being. That makes no sense whatsoever. Cutting to the chase, we're nowhere near 98% similar to, to chimpanzees. I was overblown, don't have time for the details. Now they say maybe 70%. That's a problem for them. They think, according to evolution, we should be 70% similar to a chicken. Now we're only 70% similar to a chimpanzee. Big problem for them. But let's humor them. Let's say we actually are 98% similar. Even if you're not smarter than a fifth grader, you know if we're 98% similar, we are 2% different. Well, the human genome inside each cell, just a single strand you know, of the, the complex of DNA inside the nucleus, is equivalent to about 3 billion letters written out. 2% difference of 3 billion letters is 60 million letters, 60 million differences, 60 million changes. 60 million letters is equivalent to about 5,200 page books of information. Okay, too many numbers, what's going on? You take the chimp genome, you introduce 60 million random changes that we just talked about, that produces 50 new page, uh, 200 page books of brand new information all working together wonderfully to create a human being. Are those random changes ever going to do that or even come close? No. 
Not in your wildest imagination, but that's what they teach. We actually share 50% of our DNA with bananas, but that doesn't make us half bananas. Well, maybe it does. Wrapping this whole thing up, what we've seen is that certain things look great on first blush, like that BMW and Vision, again, opening that hood and seeing that beautiful engine. But what we've seen with evolution, we've opened the hood, and the engine of evolution has been missing. It's not there. Quote from a geneticist, said, genetics has no proofs for evolution, has trouble explaining it. The closer one looks at the evidence for evolution, the less one finds of substance. In fact, the theory keeps on postulating evidence and failing to find it moves on to other postulates. Fossil missing links, natural selection of improved forms, positive mutations, etc. This is not science. One other quote, <laughs> Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We can trust the Bible from cover to cover. And even though the Bible is God's first shot at writing a book, I think he did a pretty good job. <laughs> so with all of that, the whole point of this really isn't about science. It's really not even about creation evolution. It's about the authority of God's word that we can trust it from cover to cover. And as has been mentioned many times so far, 1 Peter 3.15, be ready always with an answer of the hope that we have. In order to do that, you need to equip yourselves and so that these high percentages of our own kids are not walking away from their faith. Uh, number one thing that you should probably do, uh, Coinan Institute has so many awesome resources. I've been following Chuck for almost 30 years myself, and I've learned a lot of things from him. I probably wouldn't be here today if it weren't for a lot of things that I learned from him. There's no excuse for any of us to not have resources because there's so much available. Since most of you don't know me or my ministry, a little bit newer on the scene, I'm just going to go over very quickly resources that we brought along. I have eight individual DVDs that I've produced. This one here is the one, the talk that I just gave. Everything you just saw is on that DVD with all the PowerPoint. Uh, there's a bunch of other talks there, the bigger picture, the origin of the universe, origin of life, origin of species, dinosaurs in the Bible, top 10 questions of God created the universe, who created God? Where did all the water go after the flood? Was there really an ice age? Where did all the races come from? What about carbon-14 dating? All those types of things. Uh, evidence for the inspiration of the Bible and a bunch of other titles that we have. There's a new one coming out in probably about two, three weeks. I am titling it, Faith is Not a Four-Letter Word. It's a really cool talk. It dispels the whole myth of facts versus faith, and it will teach you how to defend the Christian worldview without knowing anything about DNA or Bible manuscripts and all these other things that sometimes intimidate us. It's a much more fundamental way of defending the Christian faith. Very powerful presentation. Then we have a 12-session seminar series, 12 half-hour talks with a study guide. Then the book that I wrote, this is kind of the second edition of it, just came out two weeks ago. So it's fresh. This is the first conference I've been at with this book. That's on the table over there. I've been told by some of the other leading creation scientists, they think this is probably the best overview that's out there right now, which I was honored to hear. So that's available at the table. Then I, we have a free monthly email newsletter. It comes out once a month and talk about things that come out in the news. They've found red blood cells and soft tissue and even DNA and dinosaur bones. It's not supposed to be there if evolution is true, but it's there. Then they found these quantum fluctuations, gravity waves that are proof of the Big Bang. It's not proof of the Big Bang. If you're on our newsletter, you'll have explanations as to what all that means. And you can sign up at the table or even directly from our website. And I have seven pocket-sized booklets on different topics, carbon-14 dating and you know, who created God and things like that. And then um, also, uh, we don't charge anything for our engagements when I travel around and speak. So anyone who becomes a monthly donor, uh, we give them a free set of DVDs and books. It's all uh, tax deductible because we're a nonprofit. If you're interested, you can see, see me at the table afterwards for that. And then lastly, you could schedule an engagement at your church. Again, I travel around the country. No, don't charge a penny for our engagements. We just ask that any expenses for travel are, are taken care of. But you could have this information and other information. It's appropriate for a Sunday morning. I usually don't do a science lecture Sunday morning, but uh, we could come to your church and put on a seminar to strengthen the faith of those in the congregation. And lastly, our website. Uh, you can go to our website to sign up for the newsletter, to get a hold of us, to see free video clips and a lot of the articles and things that I've written, and just to give you more resources to strengthen your faith. So not only that is your faith stronger, but that you can better mentor your children and grandchildren and reach out to a lost and dying world. So with that, I appreciate you putting up with me talking a million miles an hour. Even if you gave me 10 hours, I still talk fast. But... I look forward to seeing you uh, at one of the breaks over the table. If you have any additional questions, I'm just going to close my time in a quick word of prayer. 
Dearly Father, we just thank you so much for this brief time to take a look at not so much science and DNA and all that, but really the authority of your word. We just thank you for all the sacrifices that have happened over time to preserve your word. And I pray that each of us would not take it for granted, but that we would be in it every day looking for truth and answers directly from you so that, again, our faith can be strengthened so that we can reach out to a lost and dying world so that ultimately others would come to know you uh, in saving faith. And we just thank you for your graciousness and, pre and patience that you present to us each day. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. schedule of all these incredible speakers with just incredible topics and he thought this is such good stuff I wonder if people are going to get bored with great talk after great talk he said we, we need to find a clinker to put someone in here it's not a good speaker and give him a topic no one cares about and so he called me and goes he was the first person I thought of and so <laughs> now maybe it didn't actually happen that way but you're going to see the tie in here Lewis already referred to this here is that every topic that you've already heard and will hear has this in common, that the Bible is the ultimate authority for us as Christians in everything we believe. Now, the Bible arguably gets attacked more for its creation account than any other area. And if we can't trust what God tells us about the beginning, how can we trust him for anything else? And so we're going to be looking at this. That's why we're looking at the creation evolution controversy. Very, very foundational topic to everything else that we're talking about at this particular conference. And we have a problem. This has been alluded to, too. Right now, 50 to 75% or more, maybe 80% or higher, of Christian students end up walking away from their faith before they finish college. Now, how in the world can something like that happen? There are a number of factors that are going on, but one of the biggest things is that we have a set of beliefs without convictions. <laughs> kind of know what we believe, but we're not really sure why. We can't really defend our faith, and this is happening left and right. These are not children or students from religious homes. These are kids from evangelical, fundamental Christian homes who are walking away from their faith. I hear this all the time as I travel around the country and speak. Uh, just one example, I was speaking at a mega church in Florida, and afterwards I had shared this in the service, these statistics, and I had a woman come up to the table literally crying. She said, that was my son. He grew up in our home believing in God and Jesus Christ and the Bible and all that. He went off to college, and after one semester, came back and said, I'm an atheist starts debating his mom. She can't answer any of the questions. And he said, that's what I thought. My professor told me you wouldn't know. You just believe all this silly Bible stuff. He goes, well, I'm in college. I'm learning truth. I'm learning about science. And he walks off, just heartbroken. And she said, would you please talk with him? And I said, well, you, you live in the Tampa area. I live in the Milwaukee area. She said, I would pay to fly you down and put you up in a condo if you would just spend some time talking with him. I wish I had time for the whole story, and I don't. We're just touching the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg here this afternoon. But just giving you a little bit of that story, I did end up going down, spent three and a half hours with this guy in a restaurant, him swearing at me the whole time, angry young man. He was about 23 years old. Um, afterwards, again, skipping a lot of detail. Afterwards, I told him, I said, you know what, I don't want to offend you in any way, but I'm going to pray for you every day. He actually said thank you, which is odd from an atheist. That was a year ago this week. I had prayed for him every day. I think I actually missed three days in the past year, but I've been praying for him every day. Just two weeks ago, I got an email. We've been keeping in contact. He sent me an email. He said he wants to be baptized. It's, just, it's awesome. And if I had time to tell you, it was really nothing to do with science or academics. That's not what it's about. This is a spiritual battle that we're dealing with here. But this is one of the reasons why we want to have reasons for what we believe. So we're going to be getting into that. My background in a nutshell, I was raised in a Christian home. You can see very clearly that is a Christian home. <laughs> uh, then I went to public school all the way through high school. After I graduated from high school, I went to a Christian college, John Brown University, to study mechanical engineering partway through. I became more interested in physics, and so I left John Brown, went back to Wisconsin, went to the University of Wisconsin at Whitewater to get a degree in physics. And that's when my world changed quite a bit because all my professors were telling me that I was wrong about everything I believed. And that really disturbed me because I realized for the first time in my entire life that even though I knew what I believed, 
I didn't know why. <laughs> How did I know that God existed? How did I know the creation? Well, good afternoon. It is an incredible honor for me to be here this afternoon. It's an incredible challenge, too, to be talking to you just after lunch. But I'm up for the challenge to keep you guys awake. This is going to be fast-paced. Uh, James 1.19 says be slow to speak, but it doesn't say speak slow. So I'm going to go really fast. We're going to be covering a lot of stuff. Some of you might be wondering, okay, well, who is this guy and what's he talking about creation evolution uh, for with this particular conference? Well, what happened was Chuck was looking at the 